Education for the 21st Century, a monthly podcast brought to you by the Center for Developing Urban Educational Leaders, CDUEL, and the College of Education at Lehigh University. We focus on challenging issues present in the United States educational systems that face our society today. We bring attention to concerns in areas such as educational leadership, school and community, innovation in education, research to practice, and social and cultural dynamics in schools, bringing together experts to discuss challenges and present solutions. You're good. I am Tashina Kabaz, graduate student at Lehigh University's University, Dr. Beecham's GA. I am Ilia Morales, and with us today we have Professor John Drescher. Welcome. Thanks. Professor Drescher is a professor of practice in the Center for Developing Urban Educational Leaders. And this is a part of the Graduate School of Education at Lehigh University. John is also the founding director and lead faculty member of the Urban Principals Academy at Lehigh, or commonly known as UPAL. This is a rigorous 13-month educational leadership master's program, which began in June of 2013 with an emphasis on creativity and imagination in leadership, issues of inequity and privilege, as well as the importance of organizational culture to enhance student learning. All of John's classes focus on self-reflection, capacities for imaginative learning, communication, balance, and trust. He utilizes jazz as a metaphor for leadership, and his students have worked with flamenco and tango and ensembles to study leading and following, verbal and nonverbal communication, and trust. Prior to coming to Lehigh, John worked at Columbia University and at the Harvard Principal Center. John also spent 15 years as a principal in New York City and West Westchester County and four years as the head of school and superintendent of a K through 12 charter in Cambridge and Somerville, Massachusetts. John also has a background in radio and television, having written, produced, and hosted a PBS television series titled Exploring Science and produced and hosted several shows for adults and children on New York Public Radio. Welcome, John. Thanks, it's nice to be here with that long introduction. Is our, <laughs> is our time up? <laughs> Almost. So we'll start right away. Um, can you tell us about your experience as a principal or educational administrator? What are the highlights and challenges, and what did you learn from the, these experiences about the educational system? Well, uh, I did spend over 20 years uh, both in New York City and the suburbs. Uh, as a principal, first at Performing Arts in New York City, uh, as a suburban principal, elementary school level, and then as a K-12 superintendent of charter schools at uh, Prospect Hill Academy in, in Massachusetts. Each charter system is considered a separate school district. Mm -hmm. We had three schools, so uh, we had a lower, a middle, and high school, about 1,200 students. and. Uh, one of the things I, I love about leadership is the fact that if you approach it in an open manner, you're learning every day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, being in a situation like I am now, de helping develop other school leaders, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm learning and I'm helping other people learn to become uh, uh, transformative school leaders. And what were some of the challenges that you faced? People, <laughs> uh, politics, budgets, um, a variety of different uh, ways of looking at things, uh, but those can be challenges. It, it depends what you do with them. And you can let them become obstacles to progress, or you can figure out how to work collaboratively with the people presenting them and try to figure out how we can all move forward together. And I think that's always been true about leadership and certainly no more so than today. Um, how would you describe your, uh, the current state of today's educational system in public, private, and charter? Uh, it's in flux. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are some 
outstanding examples of things that are being done. I know some of our some of our students, uh, local students, uh, here at Lehigh work in uh, Allentown, and they're very excited about their new superintendent, uh, which is always a, a very positive thing. Uh, people in Bethlehem. Um, who are parts of, let's say, the community schools and uh, their attention uh, to working with the entire family mm -hmm. and the importance of that and the impact on the child. You know, that's a very positive trend. But overall, I think, I think our schools have been struggling for a long time. I think they continue to struggle. Uh, and uh, I think there's some fairly obvious reasons for that. Would you like me? I would know? love to know. <laughs> no, I, I honestly, I think a lot of it has to do with leadership. I think a lot of it has to do with leadership that uh, kind of gets boxed in, allows themselves to get boxed in. Um, you know, all too often, uh, someone will come up with an idea or an initiative. Could even be the leader, uh, but it can come from anyone within the school uh, constituent group, the school community. And too often, you hear, "We don't have the time. We don't have the money." And I don't buy that. Mm -hmm. I think there's always a way to figure out creatively the time. And it may not always just be about money. I think it's a convenient excuse. So, so I, think, I think we need leaders who will step up and think and act differently uh, and look at the ones who are already doing it. It's not like they're not happy. It's not happening. It's happening all over. There are great examples, and we need to celebrate them. Good. So would you say that this is something that has been happening in the last 20 years, like how would you compare your experience as a principal 20 years ago to today? Well, my, my first experience as a principal was in 1983. I was very young. Mm -hmm. And that's 34 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was right after the Carnegie Commission report on Nation at Risk came out, mm -hmm. which basically uh, was not, you know, overly praising the state of our nation's schools. So you have to look, where have we gone in those 34 years? Um, and uh, so I was a principal 34 years ago, and the last time I was leading schools was 2006, uh, before I moved into uh, working at the university level. And would you say that there were different challenges at, from the beginning of your career to 2006, and even now? Yeah, I, I think there are always different challenges. I think some of them have to do with the emergence of um, technology mm -hmm. and the way we use it or don't use it and the impact it has on communication. Uh, I, think, I think a huge part of the change has been, especially at the public level, mm -hmm. has to do with standardized testing. Mm -hmm. Back in 1983, when I first started, um, there were standardized tests being given, but the emphasis on the test scores mm. just wasn't there. As a matter of mm. fact, you know, 30, 40 years ago in our schools, there was actually a place, this was, this was in New York City, uh, where on a child's record card, a student's record card, if uh, a classroom teacher didn't agree with the test result, you just wrote in why, huh. and that was mm -hmm. pretty much it. You know, so you have somebody working with a student all year long, versus one test result. Well, which is more indicative, hopefully, right. of what that student is capable of doing. Right. You know, the teacher who spent 180 days, let's say, mm -hmm. working with that student, or a test they took on one morning. And it mm -hmm. seems like the teacher's voice is more valued when they have that implemented. Absolutely, and you know, I know it's, it's probably, we're probably gonna talk about it, but one of the problems in education today, we hear more and more, is teacher dissatisfaction with a lack of voice. Mm -hmm. that they're not being heard, that uh, what they have to offer, their perspective about learning students, their opinion about the organizational culture they work in, it, it doesn't count for too much. Um, so as you were saying kind of before, it seems like um, time and resources are almost an excuse. Um, why is it important then for educational leaders to use creativity and imagination in their daily work? Well, I, I think if you're creative in your approach, um, you know, one of the things we do uh, that Yulia mentioned is that in UPAL, we use jazz as a metaphor for leadership. And we, we have seminars at Jazz at Lincoln Center. In New York City, we have seminars on the art of observation at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which, I mean, these are very powerful. Um, you can read about these things in a book. 
-hmm. You can read about the importance of leading and following and distributing leadership and empowering others in a book, or you can actually experience it and watch people do it in an engaging fashion. So when you go and watch a jazz ensemble, for instance, uh, and have an opportunity to produce something yourself as part of a team, which may take you very far out of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. um, and then watch outstanding jazz musicians work and see how they lead and follow each other, they step up, they're an ensemble, people, they improvise, they develop ways to do verbal and nonverbal communication, they develop trust, mm -hmm. which is a, a huge part of what leaders need to do. Um, it, it takes your thinking in a different direction. When you, when you are in a, a, an, a museum of art somewhere and you're in a group of people, 25 people or so, and you're looking at two and three dimensional works of art, you realize that everyone in that group sees that work in a different way. They bring their own experiences, their own perspective to looking at that work of art. Uh, even It could be as simple as where you are standing in relationship to the work of art. Are you up close? Mm -hmm. Are you far back? Are you on the left? Are you on the right? And you realize the same thing goes on in schools every single day. And everybody has a perspective about what they see, what they hear, and how it makes them feel. Mm. Yes. And then when you actually experience that through the arts, in the case of what we do in UPAL, and we did it in the Apply program, and uh, you know, a lot of what happens at Lehigh stresses creativity and imagination. It gets you thinking in different ways, and you realize, as a leader, you, you bring one perspective to the table. And that's limited. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to hear what everyone else has to say. And I, I was a part of one of those um, at Jazz at Lincoln Center this last summer. Oh, and wow. so, yeah, we experienced it, um, having, you know, seeing everybody in the UPAL program and other participants that came. We had, uh, we had global students there. Exactly. We had faculty mm -hmm. there. Wow. We had some invited guests. We had graduates there. And processing the experience in a way that, you know, you, you hear somebody else and it's like, huh, I didn't consider that or we didn't process it that way in our small group and so now there's a different perspective. So um, in that line then, how do you think that universities can best prepare students that are to become teachers or educational leaders for the challenges of today's society? Well, I, th I think the way we're doing it at Lehigh is certainly one way to do it. You know, that approach is not for everyone, mm -hmm. but I, I'm firmly convinced you don't learn how to become a leader from a book. When you're on the job and something comes up, you don't go running back to your library in your <laughs> office, mm -hmm. okay, now what what book did I hear this problem, you know, read this problem in? That's mm -hmm. not the way it works. Yeah. There's no manual. Um, you know, it's like when people have a child for the first time. There's no manual <laughs> for how to raise that child. So yeah, much of true. it is common sense. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think we tend to overthink things very often, but I think the major problem is that leaders need to feel that they can open up the discussion you know, creativity and imagination does not have to mean the arts. You can be creative in just the way you schedule your school. You can be creative in the way you uh, approach and engage with all of your constituent groups, everyone within your community. We just use the arts because they tend to open people up and think a little bit more along those lines. But when, when you sit down with people who say, oh, you know what, I, I I really don't use creativity and imagination in my work, and you give them some time to think about what they're doing to make their school successful, they start to realize they're being very creative. And they've mm -hmm. had a chance to use a lot of imaginative uh, approaches. And that, that is something that we have found that is, um, you know, not everybody starts at the same level in terms right. of their comfort with being creative and thinking about solutions that that are outside the box. Um, so for some people that are used to doing that, it's like, I'm not being creative when 
that same solution for somebody else is kind of like an aha moment. Well, you just made me think of something. You know, certainly a big change for me personally in my professional standing. I remember the first year when I first became a principal in, in Manhattan at, uh, at Performing Arts, and I had a sign on my desk that said, because I said so. <laughs> and probably somewhere in the middle of the second year, I threw that sign in the garbage. Because it couldn't just be because I said so. Mm -hmm. it, it can't be, I think it's another major problem with our schools, too much is top down, my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. And that leads to so much dissatisfaction. And we keep seeing the results. They're not good. Teacher morale isn't good. I'm sure a lot of leaders are not particularly happy. Um, and the end result of all of this is it, it's impacting st students and their learning and their social emotional well being, mm -hmm. which is another aspect I don't think our schools focus in on enough. Or they'll come up with some prescribed program. Um, whatever they might want to call it mm -hmm. um, and you know they'll say they'll start organizing themselves into a professional learning community and you know every other Thursday at two o'clock they'll have their professional learning community meeting and in our classes you know, one of the questions is when should a school be a professional learning community mm -hmm. And the answer is all the time <laughs> exactly. not just every yeah. other Thursday at <laughs> two o'clock or schools that teach character education once a week for 45 minutes. It should be infused in everything. There should be a balance between academics and social emotional well-being. And we need schools where the adults in that school are modeling that for the students. Mm -hmm. When the adults aren't getting along and they're stressed, the kids know. And they pick up on it. So, and I'm going to go off script here. Um, would we have you a script? say then? <laughs> Where is that? We, we have okay. a few questions. Okay. Um, but would you say then that it is important for both leadership and staff in a school to know their community, to know sure. their, the community's challenges, the community's. Um, celebrations, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the community's sure. kind of culture. And I'm glad you're saying staff, because mm -hmm. it is staff. Mm -hmm. Every adult in this school should have a sense of responsibility for every student in that school. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a difference what their title is, whether they're certified or not certified. You have all of these, these adults, and everybody should be part, they should be part of meetings, they should be part of professional development. Um, and I think you need to start in terms of community, you need to start internally. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Elmore, in his book, uh, School Reform from the Inside Out, talks about that you can't have really outstanding external accountability until you have outstanding internal mm -hmm. accountability, where there's a sense of trust and people have a work ethic and they know how to communicate with each other properly. Otherwise, you have chaos, and then what are you going to extend out to the community? But yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And again, I think that's where the arts play such a huge role. You know, I brought in um, uh, Dr. Beecham, Floyd Beecham's book, uh, Educational Leadership and Music. Highly recommend it. Um, I think it's on Amazon. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's, very, it's, it's, it's a terrific book, but it's about there are so many different ways to develop a sense of community and how to approach people. You know, the arts are an international language. Right. Um, and um, why not use something that everyone has in their background and in their experience and see how you can bring these commonalities together? So to jump off of that, that how to integrate the arts, what are simple strategies uh, that educational leaders can implement? Um, to prevent teacher burnout while also maintaining and increasing teacher effectiveness. Yeah. Well, I, I brought in, I, we, have, um, we have a UPAL Facebook page, which mm -hmm. we started about four years ago. Um, before that, uh, you know, if there was an interesting article, video, I'd send out emails to like 300 people mm -hmm. and people were getting responses and people said, could we do, do this some other way other than emails? <laughs> So we started the UPAL Facebook page. Uh, Tammy Bartolet helped set that up. I'm really grateful because I was clueless. And, <laughs> um, and that runs all year long. Mm -hmm. 
So last night, for instance, one of our graduates, uh, Elena Ojello, who graduated a couple of years ago from cohort three, uh, we're about to start our sixth cohort next summer. She sent me, um, it wasn't a TED talk, I think it's Freethink or something, mm -hmm. about this principal from New Zealand who's now working in Virginia, uh, posted it on the UPAL Facebook page. Um, he is, I mean, one of his major functions is he's, he's like a cheerleader. He mm -hmm. gets in there. He, he just left a school uh, somewhere else in Virginia where he ha his school had been uh, a blue ribbon school of excellence, like five mm -hmm. years running. And now he's moved, I think that was in elementary, now he's moved to the middle school level. He, he um, uh, skateboards through the building sometimes. I used to roll a blade <laughs> through my school. Uh, and he is out there, he's, he's available, he's out there literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. And when, when you speak to the teachers about the energy and the excitement this guy is bringing to the school, they feel energized. The, t the teachers talk about um, how open he is, uh, you know, he spends his lunch hours eating lunch with the kids, he goes out and plays with the kids. What's stopping any leader from doing that? I did it, I had a great time, mm -hmm. you know, and about teacher dissatisfaction, another thing we posted on the UPAL Facebook page a few days ago was a uh, press release from um, uh, the National Education Policy, Policy Center from the University of Colorado, and it was about some research done by a professor, uh, Alyssa Dunn, from Michigan State. And what she did was she found teacher resignation letters that had gone viral. Because mm -hmm. somehow or other, not, and not necessarily the teachers themselves, they got posted. Not sure how, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I write a letter to you saying I'm resigning, somehow or other, it found its way into other people's hands and it got posted and they went viral. And they're talking about some of the major causes of teacher dissatisfaction and, and, um, and resignations. And for the most, it says that Professor Dunn and her colleagues found that no matter what state teachers were from or how long they had been in the profession, they felt like learning had been reduced to teaching to the test Mm -hmm. learning opportunities have been curtailed and that their own voices as teachers were being continually silenced. Um, mm -hmm. You go back five years, um, Metropolitan Life did a, um, a survey and they, they, they've been doing it for a number of years on uh, teacher morale and teacher satisfaction. Teacher, in 2012, teacher satisfaction and morale was at an all-time low. Same reasons. You, mm. you keep going back, you can go back 15, 20 years, especially to the time when standardized testing started to become mm -hmm. all-encompassing. And uh, I think a lot of people felt that the shift was away from really getting to work with the students you know in front of you mm -hmm. and the way they learn to, this is what we have to do, this is how we have to pace everything, and we have to get them ready for the test. And until the tests are over, we can't go on trips, we, you know, we can't do creative mm -hmm. things. Yes. It's all about the test. And what does that have to do with the reality of life? Right. So would you say that that is one of the major causes of, um, I guess, taking the joy out of teaching? And I'm thinking, coming from one of the, the rounds that we attended. John also runs rounds on Socratic rounds on Saturday, one Saturday a month yeah. at Lehigh. And um, in one of those, in one of the small groups, we were talking about making teaching and being an educator sexy um, so that we can okay. uh, bring more people back into being in love with the profession. So would you say that? It's a great way to put it. Yes, yeah. so... Um, you know, it's, about, it's not about the tests themselves. We need assessments in our schools, mm -hmm. but, and, and the tests are a fact, fact of life. They're not going away. But assessments aren't just tests. Mm -hmm. And there are... They look at a, the whole individual. Right, there's a myriad mm -hmm. of ways to know what our students know. Um, there was uh, a man who used to come to the Harvard Principal Center uh, every year named Jeff Howard. 
from the, uh, I think it was from the Efficacy Institute. Mm. And, you know, after a three hour, really very uh, engaging presentation, it came down to in terms of uh, student assessment, he would say, do they get it? Can they use it? Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom line. And just being able to use it on a test doesn't mean it transfers itself out to uh, what people need in real life. It doesn't mean you can't get students ready to do well in all kinds of assessments. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think most people go into education because they really have a passion for wanting to do great things for, for students and for kids and to just change and make, make the United States an even, you know, better society. Uh, and I think very, all too often that gets smothered fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's a, I, I am firmly convinced it does not have to be that way. And we see our graduates out there running schools, urban public schools, charter schools, mm -hmm. occasionally a private school, and they are picking up on these creative approaches. And you then go and speak to their teachers who actually come to our rounds. Our, mm -hmm. ra our rounds are kind of like, they're open to everyone. But a lot of our graduates come back and it's like a monthly refresher for them, which, yes. is, which is really wonderful. And we never know who's walking in, mm, which true. makes it exciting <laughs> also. And they talk about the difference that took place in their schools once these more collaborative, trusting, creative initiatives were allowed to flourish. So okay. then, on that note, what advice would you give to new principals that want to incorporate creativity or imagination in their schools but don't know how or don't, mm -hmm. can't find a way to or might even be too overwhelmed to, to find a way? Well, that's another thing I think a lot of new school leaders are overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would back it up and ask them, you know, if you could turn back time a little bit, I would say to them, before you become a new principal, uh, figure out a place and go to a, a school like Lehigh mm -hmm. for your preparation to become that leader. Uh, in, in, so you will think differently. Um, you'll realize that there's a lot of research out there and a lot of it is good. Uh, how can I incorporate this into what I'm going to do? Because if, if you're steeped in best practices, um, sometimes you have to learn how to play the system as a school leader. You give the people downtown, wherever downtown is, what they want because they need it for a certain reason, and you give them what they want, and then turn around and then do what's in the best interest of your unique school community, because every school is different. Mm -hmm. The kids are different, the staff is different, the parents are different, the leadership is different, and to think that every school is, can be cookie cutter and run the same way, you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So, um, so you, you would say then that it starts with prepar teacher your preparation or leader preparation, no, no. and then from that into application. Yeah, I, I was talking to a, a teacher recently um, from a, a school in, in New York, uh, and they have a new principal. Um, the man has a doctorate from a very well-known uh, university up in New York, and um, a situation came up in their school very early in September where a parent and a teacher were yelling at each other in the main office, in the general mm -hmm. office. The principal came out, and you would hope he would sort of embrace that situation and bring right. them into his office. Instead, the response was, take it outside. Oh, now, wow. who prepares someone to say something like that? Mm -hmm. Who hires people who will say like that? Who certifies people who will do things like that? And who keeps people in jobs mm -hmm. that will do things like that? That's not an answer. It's never an answer. And that's, and, and, and that's kind of what I'm talking about. The answer is there are all kinds of situations you're going to face as a leader. Um, use common sense. I mean, those people should have been brought into this principal's office and things should have been allowed to calm down. Right. Do you have any closing thoughts for our audience today? Um, well, 
I, I think it's important that they think, or you think, I'll look at the audience for a change. <laughs> okay, um, there are uh, lots of different situations that will come up if you're, if you're a school leader or you're a rising school leader and it's something that you feel uh, is very important, and it is, that no matter how long you study, and you know, being a principal and a, school, and a superintendent for almost 25 years, there are things that came up at the end of the 25th year that had never happened before. Things come flying in out of left field. So I think the best thing to do is prepare yourself in, with a certain state of mind about leadership. Um, about what good communication looks like, about how to collaborate with people, how to develop trust, to realize that no one in a school, including the principal, should ever be left alone with a problem. And how do you create a school community with a culture like that, that, that will thrive? And I think there are lots of different ways to go about doing it, but um, to keep yourself open, we have, we have in a, we have reflective prompts in UPAL, mm -hmm. and one of them is DKDK. You know what that is. What do you know is what that? No. Okay, well, what do you think DKDK might be? DKDK. Don't know. Yes. Okay, you're getting Don't. there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's not sure. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, no. You, yeah, there are lots of things we don't know, and we don't know. We you don't, don't know, know what you don't know. Uh -huh. So, as leaders, we need to keep ourselves open to the possibility of finding out about these things, mm -hmm. and that can come from anywhere. And if you're busy locked in your office all day long, dealing with administrative, you're not out where you belong, which is in classrooms and hallways and in the lunchroom and out in the schoolyard, at recess, wherever it might be, those possibilities of finding out those things are, are extremely limited. Mm -hmm. And they can come from the students, they can come from parents, they can come from staff, they can come in. I used to get great data um, from FedEx delivery person, because I remember sitting talking to him one time and he went in and out of a lot of schools and said, I love coming into your school. I said, why? He said, because there's a good feeling here. He said, no, go into a lot of schools where you don't have a good feeling. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can sense it like that. And I think the importance is allow yourself to be open to those DK, DK moments because they can come from anywhere. And if you're closed and narrow and it has to be your way or the highway, that's not going to happen. The, um, um, yeah, we, we, um, we read a book in our classes called Crossing the Unknown Sea by uh, David White. Uh, it's White with a Y, who is a, uh, he was a poet. He is a poet. He's also a Fortune 500 consultant. Okay. And he starts the book off with um, quotes from William Blake. And basically, William Blake talks about having to open up the chinks in the armor of your uh, cavern that you put yourself into. Hmm. And the doors of perception can be opened. And I think that's how the, the Rock Roof, the Doors got, got their name, the Doors, from the work of William Blake. So that's what I'm suggesting. You know, open up the chinks in your armor of your cavern and leave those doors of perception open for the possibilities that can come to you. Thank you very much, John. Yes. Thank you for your education for the 21st century. Please join us next month.